So what is virtual autism and could your child be suffering from it if they are diagnosed on the spectrum? Most of us aren't aware that there is emerging research that shows that prolonged exposures to screen, even just more than one hour per day, can mimic autism symptoms that can be reversed simply by adjusting screen time exposure. So what can happen if we allow an increase of screen time exposure in our child's developmental time? So screen time impact is huge. Excessive screen time, especially in young kids, uh, especially between the ages of one to three, can interfere with some of the most important developmental activities like social interaction, uh, play, physical activity. These are three major components that we don't give a lot of thought to when we're thinking about developmental milestones for neurodevelopmental, uh, for our neurons to develop. And they are though, they're actually shaping and wiring parts of the brain. And what it looks like when we can allow our, when we give our children um, excessive screen time, the symptoms that come are actually very, very much aligned with a toxin that we could see exposing kids with autism. So for example, these could look like uh, limited, to, limited verbal communication, in some cases, zero communication, limited eye contact, behavioral issues or repetitive behaviors, such as more obsessive compulsive disorders, rigidity, um, and of course, difficulty with social interactions. Pretty much the what they use in assessments to decide if your child is to be um, diagnosed with autism. But I think that the most interesting thing of this statement and of these symptoms is how quickly some of these symptoms can reverse themselves and these kids can gain those neurodevelopmental milestones back um, with real world activities are brought in. So now there is a little, so let's be just candid and say that there is some controversy around virtual autism and it's still totally being debated. Some experts are emphasizing that they want more of a causation, direct causal link. And we know that causation and correlation are very similar. And in many cases, the missing link, uh, but causation and correlation means that sometimes the causation is this is a definite cause to this and correlation means, well, we see this in almost every case, but we're not sure if it's exactly the cause. But I think that it definitely is something that should be explored very, very quickly with the amount of autism being diagnosed in our day to day. We are looking at somewhere along the lines of one in 21 in California. If projections continue in this direction, they're saying that by 2025, there's the potential that every um, that it could go even up higher. And I believe by 2020, 2030, they're thinking that it could be anywhere between one and two children will be diagnosed with autism. So when we see something of this much growth, we definitely need to be paying attention as a society. And in case you didn't know, the current guidelines for pe from pediatricians to families for screen time are actually to limit screen times in the first two years of age completely to zero. Children in that age group are building neurons and they are in their state of major development and need that wiring peekaboo, all of these interactions with their environment close and far as they're developing eyesight and all of their senses. And these are severely impacted when a screen is introduced during this time. And so for most pediatricians, the recommendation is as kids are growing over three is still very limited to about 30 minutes. And then as ages progress to a maximum of one hour per day, our current government recommendations for any screen time for any human being is actually an hour per day in case we didn't know. So hi, my name is Natalie Pelto and I am a co founder at Blue Life RX. We are a wellness company and a wellness and health company that focuses on helping children and families with kids with autism that are on the spectrum to gain and live the life of their dreams through health initiatives and, inter and interventions. We also help to support families and physicians who are wanting to bring lifestyle medicine to their patients and to healthcare. If this sounds like you fall in these categories, make sure to drop a subscribe below. I want to share a little bit about my own journey through screen time with my son. So my son at the age of two was fighting a severe nonverbal autism diagnosis. This was about 10 years ago. iPads were very new. 
uh, apps were not geared towards children. I think I remember my son having access to his first app after five years old. And it was like, a, I think it was an app for playing with, I mean, like Candy Crush was a big thing back then. And I think that one of the things that it was in my benefit that these things were not accessible. And so YouTube kids was not a thing. These things came in after. And so for, for my, in my story and my generation, autism did not come from a, a screen or an iPad. My son just didn't even have access to those things. But that isn't the case of the families that I work with now. What, what I want to share are two very specific scenarios that have two of the families that I have worked with in the past, completely different phases or places where they were within the program that I, uh, that I created the blue life autism program. You can learn more about it below. Um, there's a link there for a two hour masterclass on exactly what we do within that program and how it can benefit your kids with brain development and supports. But what I have been seeing more and more and more, well, first of all, I have seen families come into the blue life autism program with a virtual autism diagnosis. And I have also seen families come into the program with a severe nonverbal autism diagnosis when you can clearly see that screens are impacting their or are impacting and have impacted their neurodevelopmental disorder. And I want to share just a little bit about what what this looks like because it shows up in every child very repetitively in the same way because it impacts the brain not in different compartments it impact well it does impact it in different compartments but it's a very specific loop of dopamine GABA all these things are impacted in every child no child is exempt from this and so I want to share a little bit of what it looks like and maybe this will help you to understand a little bit more about um, if your child may be suffering from over screen exposure so one of the things that it impacts is tolerance development. So similar to other forms of stimulation, because this is a stimulant, right? When we look at um, a screen and it has a bright blue light, it's actually stimulating cortisol within the body. Um, it, it gives us high levels of dopamine, and so which can lead to development to development of tolerance. So if we stimulate dopamine, which is kind of our hormone that keeps us motivated. Back in the day, we were using dopamine to, and not as me as a female, we would say, but maybe the hunters and warriors of our tribes, they would use dopamine when, or they would have a hit of dopamine when they would see a sprig crack, right? On a leaf. And it would show or tell them that there was an animal nearby that could potentially be hunted for survival. It is a survival chemical. So it was and is important. The problem stems when we start to develop a tolerance to it, needing more and more dopamine hits. It is a very, if we have low dopamine, we are looking for more do dopamine. And why would we have low dopamine? Because we're using it so much. It is a chemical that we can, that we produce, but can be overused. So over time, the brain requires more intense stimulation to achieve the same level of pleasure. And this shows a lot in our kids when they're looking at a screen and rewatching the same part over and over and over again. And they like know that whole, that whole show by heart. They fast forward to the parts that they like. They skip the parts they don't, they rewind back to the part they like because they are trying to stimulate that same hit of dopamine. And over time they get very frustrated and then they change and they start to get frustrated even being on the iPad. Um, so the other thing is that it can reduce sensitivity. So overstimulation of the dopamine pathway can make other less stimulating activities such as reading and playing outside seem less appealing and rewarding. For a child who isn't on screens all the time, going to play with your friends, there is nothing better. But for a child who has literally been on screens for years at more than a few hours a day, for them, that's not going to be as stimulating. They can get that same impact of kids playing in like a war movie or into a cartoon that has, you know, bright graphics and a lot of things happening, almost like um, it's like they're in an action movie all day long, why would playing with your friends not like not like be any more exciting? Now for me, it would be, but for someone who feels like they're always in an action movie and, you know, playing with their very best friends and zip lining and doing all the things, um, this is going to be more appealing and just by default. And so we do have to realize that what we see and put in front of our children is perceived very differently than what we put in front of adults. 
for what a child sees, it is very real. And for what an adult sees, they know that they are actors on a screen. Now, how did this show up for two of my clients? For one of my clients who had been in the program for some time, they were absolutely doing phenomenal. They had focus on the nutritional therapy aspects. They were filling the nutrition gaps. They were focusing on the removal of the things that were harming. They were help for, focusing on gut health. So all of the pieces had been implemented. They had overcome picky eating. And yet their child was still nonverbal and their child was still struggling with severe deregulation. And one of the areas that we had not looked at, which is part of the program that I run, is the amount of screen time per day. When we broke it down to, it wasn't even necessarily the amount of screen time, but that screen time was beginning to be expected first thing in the morning if a child woke up at like four or five. Now we know that children on the spectrum can have very different sleeping patterns at and these are also health related in most cases, by the way. But um, when we realize, uh, and we're a parent who's exhausted working and our husband is working, everybody is working and our child wakes up at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m., it almost feels like it is the only, it is the only support that we have in the home that will help our children regulate. And this makes sense because it is there, it is bright, and all of a sudden they become quiet and they are very, very immersed in this activity, which gives us a chance to potentially catch up on sleep. Makes sense to me, except what if by offering such things to our children so early, it's causing a deregulated cortisol level, like as if they're waking up for the day, instead of helping our children learn to self-soothe and a few other things. But that is what we were seeing. And so I wanted to give that example because I know it's very, very, very common for the addiction to screens to start right in the morning, which is actually the worst time to allow for dopamine to start running our day. And it kind of overtakes serotonin, which is like that feeling of happiness, of being part of a family, feeling of connection. And so we were seeing deregulation throughout the entire day. And the first challenge that I gave was, Maybe we should just try to extend how long it takes, like how, uh, like some time before you offer the screen. And it was amazing within just a few days, which I did not get to hear till well, a week later, um, there was a complete drastic change in behavior in this family. The next, um, the next client that I saw where screens were absolutely the causal factor of deregulation or of all the other medicine pillars being deregulated was a family who came into the program and they were lovely, like big family, lots of kids. I believe there was three or four kids like with this child who was a little older. And this child would actually sleep all day um, and then wake up at around, you know, between five and 7 p.m. and be up all night and so this family was watching their child be on screens from seven at night all the way into the late morning of seven in the morning. And then that's, that child would go back to bed and they would repeat the cycle. And I said, well, that makes sense. And, she, and the mom at first was really focused on addressing picky eating and nutrition. And although this is an amazing place to start, I said, one of the reasons your child is having such an issue with picky eating is because they're overstimulated, they're tired, their circadian clock is completely upside down, which will actually increase picky eating. So you may have, you're working against, you know, a very hard wall. Let's see what we can do with the wall, which is how can we address screen times at night? And one of the things that really showed was that by supporting just a slow integration of some of the things that I teach in the Screen Less Challenge, which is a completely free challenge that is actually running from September 2nd, 2024 to September 6th, you can actually register down below, which I highly recommend, completely free resource. We found a way to slowly transition off of screen slowly and not off completely, but at different times, extending the time. And what happened was nothing short of a miracle. The child reversed their clock, was back sleeping when they were supposed to, and of course, interacting with the family more. If your children are going to bed, for example, if other members of the family are going to bed at five o'clock, or sorry, at five o'clock, at seven o'clock at night, and your child is just getting up, that means that there's an entire relationship opportunity that is being missed. 
And so we started to work on that. And of course, gains started to come, picky eating started to be overcome, and it was just absolutely fantastic. So now there is emerging research that um, if there's emerging, I shouldn't say it, and there is. If there's emerging research that shows that virtual autism can be reversed with a reduced schedule on screens, I understand that this is one of the most difficult areas for parents in our current day and age to want to address first. And I know why. It makes sense. Because there is complete fear around PTSD of taking a screen away from a child in case they have a meltdown, or in another case of a meltdown saying no or not right now. So I totally understand that the biggest thing that I see and the biggest reason that does make complete sense is why do we want to give ourselves more struggle? But what if I told you that the struggle and in that struggle is where you actually learn and can, can create connections and that the struggle isn't a night and day thing. So below I'm gonna talk about two tips uh, for reducing screen time and I cannot wait to share them with you. And before that I, dro I drop these awesome resources, um, I wanna remind everyone that below there is access to the Screen Less Challenge. If you're watching this video uh, in the times of September, uh, before September 2nd of 2024, you want to be in that challenge. It is an interactive challenge that, I don't know if you've ever heard the saying, if you want to go fast, go alone, but you're gonna get, in, in what I see in the program and even outside of the program when families are trying to speed through autism, is that people get stuck. If you wanna go far, you go together. And so having access to a tool that will connect us all, that will allow for questions to be answered, there's an interactive live Q&A at the end of there, you wanna be in there. Okay, so here are my two strategic tips to reduce screen time without having to pull your hair out or feeling like you have to or losing your hair from stress. Um, it can be challenging and I get that. Reducing screens is gonna be challenging whether you want it or not, but so is autism. And so we get to choose the challenge that will yield results of positive results for years to come. So the first tip is to create a screen time schedule. Don't even have to put it into action yet. Just create one. Set the clear limits. So establish specific times of day when screen use is allowed and beneficial to you. And then stick to these limits consistently. For example, you may allow screen time only after homework, which obviously we know for a nonverbal child, that's not going to work, but only between dinner time or uh, sorry, between school and dinner time. And this makes sense. This is the best use of your time if you need to be making food and you need to be supporting and um, and limiting. And so this is about one hour in the evening. Also, what I would will probably talk about within the program, uh, within the free challenge is your timing matters. If you allow your child to have screen time first thing in the morning, you will have a, a harder struggle getting it off. I know some families who use it as a feeding tool for their kids and they are worried their children will not eat without it. Maybe that's not where you start. Lowest hanging fruit always. But always, but creating a screen time schedule is going to be a game changer and sticking to it. Now within this, there's also different ways that we can communicate the rules. For a child who is verbal, their verbal cues will be very different than a child that is not. For example, if you have a nonverbal child, sometimes timers are messed. That loud noise that gets them out of that dopamine loop that is constantly kind of addictive Having timers is very helpful. I know this because we use them and they've been very successful within our program. Being very clear um, and communicating the rules with visual timers with kids who are nonverbal and verbal, really allowing them to understand that no does not mean no. It, uh, language is also very important and that no does not necessarily mean never. It just means not right now or later. The second one is to encourage alternative activities. So what do you do in that time? What do you do on the other times where after dinner, you're used to letting them have screens until bedtime and then you had your fight before bed and bedtime took an hour because they were so deregulated from their dop dopamine like transition. So encouraging alternate, uh, alternative activities is going to change your fi family dynamics. Yes. Is it difficult to change? Of course, but is success, on, is success in any venture on the other side of change? Definitely. So promoting physical activity is one of the best things. Now, not only will it support healthy 
um, transitions from screens and an upper and and an activity to replace it. It will also help with re with removing aggression, helping with better digestion, helping with your child um, and their bristle chart perfection, which we talk a lot about in the program. Foster hobbies and introduce your children to hobbies like reading, reading with them, uh, drawing. If they're nonverbal, maybe this isn't an option. Playing musical instruments uh, or crafting. Play with them with their Play-Doh. Play with them with mud. Even if they're not really understanding the purpose of it, be in it with them. Just spending time with you is an activity. And it is one that we do not do enough with our children in today's very, very fast paced life. And going into, that is what it goes into, the family time. Plan a regular family activity so that if you are on a schedule and you know that your child is thriving in repetition, this is what therapy uses often is the focus on repetition, repetition, repetition. And so if your child is doing better in routine, then make sure that you have very specific family, um, family activities routinely expected, such as board games, cooking together, them helping you in the kitchen, them just dancing with you in circles, stimming together, whatever that looks like at that time, that's going to allow them to rebuild those neuron connections, because these are the things that are supporting brain development. Now, implementing these strategies <clears throat> can help to not just reduce screen time, but promote more balance and healthy lifestyle for your children, but also increase their neuron pathways and help them with brain development. If you like this video, make sure to, to watch the rest of them and then subscribe. We send, we, we put them out weekly.